Okay, the time is six o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started here. Hello and welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us this Thursday evening. To help celebrate Women's History Month, Bikes Peak Library District is happy to bring you this presentation of Colorado Women in World War II by author and historian Gail Beaton. Tonight's program time will be approximately 60 minutes. Gail will give a presentation lasting about 45 to 50 minutes. And following that, we will have a question and answer session. This program will also be recorded for later viewing through the Pikes Peak Library District's YouTube channel. Tonight's presenter, Gail Beaton, is a historian, author, retired teacher, Chautauqua presenter, and volunteer member of the Advisory Council of the Center for Colorado Women's History at the Byers Evans House Museum. Her first book, Colorado Women, A History, was a finalist for the 2013 Colorado Book Award and for the 2013 Willa Award from Women Writing the West. And her most recent book from 2020, brought to us by the University of Colorado Press, is Colorado Women in World War II. Gail is also a Chautauqua presenter. She has been here at the Pikes Peak Library District a couple of times. So if you ever have an opportunity to see one of her presentations, uh, definitely do so. We hope to have them in the near future when we resume in-person programming. So Gail Beaton, welcome and thank you for being with us. Thank you, Brian. I'm glad to be here. Four months before the attack on Pearl Harbor, a member of the Denver Women's Press Club, Mildred McClellan Melville, predicted that war would reach the United States and that its long arm would reach into the lives of all Americans. She warned club members that the coming war will not be a man's war at the front. It will be a civilian war reaching into every kitchen and nursery. It will be a war not only of bombs, but also of butter, not only of Maginot lines, but also of morale. It will be a war which leaves no room for hysteria and helplessness, snobbishness and intolerances. And reach it did in the huge numbers of drafted and enlisted loved ones, in the unprecedented number of women in the armed forces, in the availability of new job opportunities and in the form of government mandates, restrictions and regulations. Because of its landlocked location far from either coast, Colorado was enticing to those who produced war materiel. In 1940, Denver was chosen as the site of the Denver Ordnance Plant. It is now presently the site of the Denver Federal Center. This Remington Arms factory produced over 6 million bullets a day for the war. <clears throat> After December 7th, it first opened in uh, the fall of 1941, right before the attack on Pearl Harbor. After Pearl Harbor, there were additional bases and factories for the defense effort. Now everybody was pretty certain that it was going to entail a lot of people to run this war, especially when we're fighting on two different fronts. Nationwide, over 358,000 American women served in the military during World War II. It was obvious that there was going to be a huge number of women that were necessary in the Army Nurse Corps and the Navy Nurse Corps. At the beginning of the war, however, we only had about 1,500 nurses in those two branches of the military. So the government decided to issue a quota to every state so that they would register nurses that would be willing to join either the Army Nurse Corps or the Navy Nurse Corps as the need arose. Colorado's quota was 500 nurses. At the attack, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Althea Williams, who had been working at Poudre Valley Hospital in Fort Collins, joined the Army Nurse Corps. She was immediately placed on active duty and sent to Fitzsimmons. From there, she was sent to the Pacific. 
for the rest of the war, she treated not only men with war wounds, but also those suffering from tropic diseases like diphtheria and scrub typhus. They ended up with so many patients that R&R was canceled. By the end of the war, Althea had over three months of leave time, but she had no complaints. She said, they asked us to serve and we served. And we served because our boyfriends and our fathers and our brothers were all serving in the military and they deserved the best medical care and the best nursing. I like to call Leela Allen my army nurse because she was the first one I interviewed for this particular project. Leela was graduating from nursing school when army recruiters approached her and her fellow graduates and said that it was important for them to enlist in the army because if they didn't, they would have to start drafting nurses. And of course that would be a stain on the um, profession or the reputation of the nursing corps. So she did, she um, signed up with a few of her friends and they were asked where they would like to have basic training. They replied Colorado because they thought they might have the opportunity to see um, Native Americans. After basic training, she was sent to Texas where she had additional training as well as meeting someone who would become her future husband. Then it was off to New York City and boarding a converted ocean liner for the journey across the Atlantic Ocean. It was now August of 1944 and she boarded an LST, a landing ship tank vehicle to cross the English Channel. Only two months after the terrific D-Day invasion of the allies of European continent. She recalled to me that she could still see the strings of parachutes hanging from the uh, trees and that the beach line, uh, the shoreline was still covered with uh, debris. For the next rest of the year or the rest of the war, she spent time with her hospital unit crossing between France and Germany falling very close to the uh, troops. Her duty station was the shock and pre-op tent. Obviously there weren't going to be, you know, brick and mortar hospitals that close to um, the battlefront. There were a number of times when the men said, oh, nurses, you know, you shouldn't be this close, ma'am. You shouldn't be this close. And they would simply say, no, it's our duty to be here. You know, we're not, we're not backing off. At the end of the war in Europe, she was um, stationed just outside the Buchenwald concentration camp when it was liberated by the Allies. And she and the other nurses were taken through two days after the liberation. And um, their guide was one of the few survivors of the camp, took them through the crematoriums and past the uh, huge mounds of skeletons and, and corpses. You can imagine that that memory still um, bothers her today. Now another army nurse was Betty Berry, who served in the Pacific as a air evacuation nurse. And on her journey across the Pacific, which like the Atlantic was infested with submarines, she sat on the deck. She said she wasn't afraid of anything. So she sat on the deck of the ship and knitted the entire uh, crossing. Then when she was there in uh, the Pacific Islands, there was a point in time where they had air raids um, and they were of course required to jump into a trench for safety. So the nurses did the, and they found themselves sharing this trench with a huge python. Well, fortunately for them, um, the MPs also jumped in and shot and killed uh, the python. When the danger was over, she asked what they were gonna do with the snake. And she said, they said, you know, we don't know, we don't care. And she said, well, I'd like to have it. So she kept it and she later had it skinned and made into a pair of shoes and a purse. Pretty uh, amazing woman. Now the Navy Nurse Corps also had flight nurses. And since they're serving out in the Pacific, of course, it was important that their training included how to um, handle a water or a crash landing, uh, be able to prove that they could swim a large, a long distance underwater, because of course with crash landings, you would have had oil spill and catch on fire on the surface of the ocean. 
They also had to prove that they could tow uh, a wounded soldier so far through water and things of that nature. The first graduates were on flight evacuation uh, courses from Guam to Iwo Jima, which was the important battle at that time. By the time that Jackie Jaquette graduated in the second class, it was the battle at Okinawa that was raging. So she would board a airplane in Guam at the airfield about 1.30 in the morning. She would be dressed as the nurse you see there on the left in green overalls, uh, nylon overalls and a matching baseball cap. She would be accompanied by a medical corpsman. And in the eight, eight hour flight from Guam to Okinawa, they made sure that they set up the cots. You can see a row of four on both sides of the airplane. There were seats in the back of the airplane for ambulatory patients. They also checked all their medical supplies and made meals for their future patients. If they had time, they tried to catch a few hours of sleep uh, on the floor of the airplane. Once they landed at Okinawa, and of course the battlefield is, the battle is raging all around them, they had only about uh, 45 minutes to load approximately 30 patients onto the airplane and take off again. Um, on the way back then, of course, they're checking their patients for any complications. Um, they're administering, administering uh, drugs and medicines, also changing dressings, feeding the soldiers, and uh, of course, talking with them and trying to keep them calm. Most of them were, of course, just only too happy to get off of that island. Now, um, there was one time that Jackie told me that um, one of her patients had a huge chest wound and he wasn't doing very well in this unpressurized cabin. So she asked the pilot if he could fly a little bit lower. And he said, ma'am, I'll fly, I'll skim the ocean if that's what it takes to get these men uh, back to Guam safely. And so, you know, those pilots were, you know, the cream of the crop also. Now, Omi Halder was in the third class of flight nurses. She also flew flights between Guam and Okinawa. And she said, besides doing all the requirements, she would really try to ask the men about their families and offer to call them when they got back to uh, the hospital in Guam if, if they wanted her to do so. The Women's Army Auxiliary Corps was founded in 1942, followed by the Women's Army Corps, which had dropped its auxiliary status in 1943. The vast majority of women were um, wax or army soldiers during World War II. Olita Crane was one of the first African Americans in Colorado to enlist in the WAC. She uh, had seen a recruiting poster that said, help win the war, join the army band. And she said, well, this is wonderful. You know, I play the, the cornet and the saxophone. I can, I can do that in the army. So she enlisted. And after that, she found out that the WAC band at the time was only for white women and not for black women. Later, the Corps would have five different WAC bands and one was for uh, African-American women. But by that time, she was an officer candidate school and did not uh, attempt to, to transfer over to the WAC band. Olita ended up serving 20 years in the military and mustering out with the uh, rank of major. Sunshine Cloud Smith was a member of the Southern Ute Indian tribe of Southwestern Colorado. When she enlisted with a couple of her friends, um, she was sent to New York as an army surgical technician. After the war, she returned to the reservation and became a very important uh, tribal council leader. As you're probably aware, the United States government through Executive Order 9066 removed Japanese Americans from the West Coast and incarcerated them in 10 different camps in the interior. Colorado was home to the Amachi camp at Granada in southeastern Colorado. In 1943, the government allowed internees to leave the camps if they signed loyalty agreements and had a worthwhile job. You may be familiar with the 442nd unit or regiment 
of Japanese American men who were highly decorated during the war. Japanese American women also left the camps in 19, beginning in 1943 for a variety of jobs, including the military. Iran, Iris Watanabe was an Amachi intern from um, Southern California. Suigato was a Colorado resident. Colorado did not intern its own Japanese American residents, mostly through the efforts of Governor Ralph Carr. These two women enlisted in the Women's Army Corps and were sent to Fort Snelling to be trained in military intelligence. Now, Larry Field in Aurora had a huge, very important photo laboratory school. Bernice Moran was one of those who was trained in how to operate all the various military cameras, develop her own film, mix her own developing solutions, and be able to repair the cameras. Now the waves were the women in the Naval Reserve, women accepted for volunteer emergency service. They were initially barred from uh, overseas duty, though of course the WACs were not, um, but they were later sent to places like Bermuda and the Bahamas and Hawaii. The University of Colorado in Boulder had a Japanese language school. It was a very intense immersion um, type coursework. It was held for male Navy personnel as well as for waves. Both um, the men and the women were given the exact same classes and exams, but they were done in uh, segregated classes. They had three hours of class every single day, Monday through Friday, followed by nine hours of studying. After the first week of school, none of the classes were held in any language but Japanese. Later, they also offered uh, Chinese and Mandarin, but originally it was just for the Japanese language. Then on Saturdays were a set of grueling exams covering that week's uh, material. After graduation, the women were sent to Washington, D.C. for translation and code work, and the men were sent to the Pacific Theater of Operations. As you can imagine, paperwork is very important um, in the military and in government work. Edna Guys was a law school graduate who enlisted in the waves, and she was sent to Washington, D.C. to work with the Bureau of Naval Personnel, where she processed uh, disability and benefit claims for those uh, men and, and women. Waves also worked as link trainer instructors. This was a uh, job often given to women who had uh, teaching experience. There on the far right is Elaine Watkins, who was a Denver teacher before enlisting in the Waves. She was um, a link trainer instructor in Atlanta and then also in Kansas City. The link trainer is a simulation um, vehicle, if you want to call it that, to train pilots on the ground. There was um, a professor at, of English at what is now CSU, who was rather unhappy uh, in the years, disgruntled, I guess, maybe a little antsy as a professor. And so when the war began, she decided to join the waves. And she was very thrilled with her time in the waves. She was one of those that uh, had the pleasure of hearing First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt speak at Spith College. That's where she received her training. She also later wrote in her diary about basic training. Up at 625, dress, mustard, messed. School all day, our regular schedule, and home exhausted in the evening. It is wonderful. Other waves uh, served in the transportation or in the aircraft areas. Uh, you've got waves there as machinist mates. And then at the bottom on the far right, you can see that link trainer where women are um, practicing their instructing with another um, female wave sitting inside the vehicle. And I'll show it another picture of that later too. Now the WASP or the Women Air Force Service Pilots was of course founded in order to train women to fly military aircraft, women pilots, to fly military aircraft in order to release male pilots for combat duty. 
Colorado had a number of women who considered Colorado um, their home state. There on the left, you have uh, some women in training. Now, the women were given the same military pilot training that the men were given. Their training occurred at Sweetwater, Texas, and about a over a thousand women successfully graduated and uh, flew as WASP during the war. As I said, they did the exact same classwork as the men, but the men had the advantage of having uniforms in training that fit them. The women did not. So they um, issued the women used mechanics overalls in sizes 42 to 48. As you can see, this was absolutely huge on these women. Uh, they cinched it up at the waist, they rolled the sleeves, they folded over at the, at the waist, they rolled their uh, pant legs, all sorts of things in order to, you know, not trip and everything. But it really caused problems in the airplanes when they were in training. Lucille Dahl, who later worked with the Weather Bureau transporting uh, officials from one part of the Midwest to another to check out Weather Bureau stations, once was in training and she was supposed to put her airplane through a spin. And just before she was ready to initiate the first spin, she looked down and her belt was undone. And she knew there's just no way she would have omitted that number one safety uh, check. So she figured that the sleeve got caught in her um, buckle and opened it up. Another woman talked about having uh, the sleeve get caught on the stick and sent her plane into a spin. And then here you have the blue box or the link trainer that was used to train all um, military pilots. It was often called the, the blue box. Um, Jerry Ashwell, Grace Ashwell, absolutely hated it. Uh, you can imagine when you close that all up in Sweetwater, Texas during the summer, how absolutely hot and uh, humid it would get in there. Peggy McCaffrey, fourth from the left, was a Montrose native who um, qualified and successfully completed her uh, training at Sweetwater and then was assigned Bainbridge um, Air Base in Georgia. And she was one who, in fact, all of these women here, their job was to fly airplanes that were either new off the line or had been damaged and had be, been repaired. And Peggy talked about one time she took a plane up to test it to make sure the repairs were good. And she all of a sudden found herself descending faster than she had ascended. So um, she popped the stick, nothing happened popped it a second time, again, nothing happened, popped it a third time and finally pulled out of the spin. Well, she knew something was wrong with the airplane. So she found a safe place to land, got out, thought, well, there's something wrong with the airflow here, ran her hand along the airplane, uh, the airfoils and found a huge wad of bubble gum stuck. So she pried it off, got back in the airplane and it flew just fine. Next to her is another Colorado native, Jane Died, um, there third from the, the left. Now the women not only flew uh, airplanes that needed to be tested and flew officials to various places, they also moved aircraft from one part of the country to another as needed. And they also flew target airplanes. And this was to help the men practice their gunnery skills. And so the men would, of course, be on the ground. The women would have a large canvas banner that they would tow behind their airplane. And the gunnery am ammunition would be um, marked with red and green and yellow and different colors so that when the plane came back down after being shot at, the banner being shot at, uh, they could tell which gunner hit what part of the banner. Unfortunately, uh, sometimes they could also see who hit uh, the back end of the airplane. Now, the women Air Force service pilots were not military at, during the war, but as you can see, they definitely did uh, military-like duties. So in 1977, they were finally recognized uh, as military and given honorary discharges. Then in March of 2010, they were awarded the Congressional Gold Medal uh, there at the White House. 
Spar, Semper Paratus, always ready, were the women in the U.S. Coast Guard. They were often confused with the waves because their uniforms were so similar. They were also the only women to train at a male military academy. The other women were trained like at Fort Des Moines or Smith College, um, someplace like that, Hunter College, etc., cetera, um, as well as different air bases and army bases. Jane Silverstein was a Denver native who was trained as a landscape architect and who had her own business prior to the war. After she joined the Coast Guard, she was sent to New York where she was in charge of cataloging all of the naval properties and Coast Guard properties within a four state area. You can imagine how many lighthouses and, and everything else that was. After that, she was assigned New York Harbor where she was responsible for the coming and going of ships out of the harbor, giving them authorization, which berth to be at and all those kinds of things. Colorado is probably, to my knowledge, the only state that had a woman as a captain in the uh, US Merchant Marine during World War II. Mary Converse was originally from Massachusetts where she earned um, her, she was sworn in as a captain after um, qualifying. And here in Denver though, she was about 68 at the time of World War II. And she was asked by the US Navy recruiting office if she would teach officer candidates seamanship and navigation, which she did every Tuesday and Thursday to about 10 or 15 men. And then of course, afterwards she would offer them cigarettes and uh, a chance to visit and refreshments and, and things like that. The United States Marine Corps was the last military branch to open up its doors to um, women, even though they had women serve as marinettes during World War I. Now, when they announced that they were going to accept women, the public thought, oh, I wonder what uh, acronym they're going to have, you know, like WAVES or WAX or SPAR. And the Commandant said, no, they're Marines and that's all they're going to be called. So they did ha not have any fancy or cute acronym. The U.S. Marine Corps, as a known as an elite fighting um, unit, was desired not only by male enlistees, but also by the women. There was one woman in Fort Collins who um, heard a recruiting speech from in her sorority and decided that she had to join the Marines. So she asked her father to sign her enlistment papers because she was under age. At first he refused, but then he um, did and she joined the Marines. He was so proud that he put a service flag in the window of his train. And when his coworkers would say, oh, Gordy, you've got a, a, a son in the military. He'd say, no, I've got a daughter in the Marine Corps. So this is Marie Jansen, who um, worked in El Toro and El Central as uh, in transportation and just some of the various military vehicles that she drove, not only within the base, but also off base. Now, before I get to women and defense work, which is the second of three parts of my book, I just want to point out again how important it was for many women to join the military, just as it was for many of the men. And there are stories that women told about uh, going to a recruiting office and being weighed and um, you know measured to see if they met the minimum requirements. Many women did not. They didn't weigh 100 pounds or, and all of that. So they would leave, go and stuff themselves, and then come back to the recruiting station and um, be weighed again. There were also stories of women who would, um, during the winter months, hold their heavy overcoats and their purses as they stood on the scales in order to um, pass the minimum requirements. There was one woman in Trinidad that reported to the recruiting office and found out that she was overweight and was one inch too short. So she went back home, dieted, lost 26 point, uh, pounds, returned to the recruiting office, 
She made weight, and not only that, but she ended up somehow growing an inch also. Um, you know, sometimes I think people just look the other way when they really need um, people to fill particular jobs. And obviously height's not going to be um, that important in some, in some cases with the jobs. The other thing is, um, you know, could, going from civilian life to military life would be very different for men and for women. Women also, though, uh, found themselves in being trained in what had been a um, total male-dominated domain, such as Fort Des Moines. So when women were taken through the barracks, they were seeing urinals for the first time. And women asked, is this where we, uh, you know, soak our feet after marching? Or is this where we're supposed to brush our teeth? And of course, fortunately, somebody set them straight. Um, there was one woman who was given the task of cleaning the um, latrines the next morning, her first morning there on base. And she didn't know what that was. So she and the other women assigned just cleaned the toilets. And of course, that worked out just fine. And then, of course, uh, all the military lingo. Um, you know, like head and aft and stern and all of those kinds of things and the acronyms that military personnel are so fond of using was very different for women um, when they initially joined. Now, women were equally important in defense plants and originally they were recruited if they were single. But then as the need became even greater and the war continued on, they started recruiting uh, women and women with children and even women with young children. And they often would, uh, there was lots of posters, recruiting posters, there were um, newsreels that, you know, encouraged women to join, posters that were at the um, grocery store and at the uh, post offices, uh, you know, all of those kinds of places. And they often tried to relate war work and what was done in a factory to what women had traditionally been doing at home. So something like this, if you've sewed on buttons or made buttonholes on a machine, you can learn to do spot welding on airplane parts. If you've done fine embroidery or made jewelry, you can learn to do assembly on time fuses, radio tubes, if you've used an electric mixer in your kitchen, you can learn to handle a drill press. The need, as I said, was great. It was estimated that it would take 14 war production workers to support one man in combat. In 1941, they did a survey of various industries and they asked them, exclusive, not counting your office employees, what percentage of your plant workers are female? And as you can see there, the aviation workers were 1% female. And then they said, what do you anticipate the need will be in 1943? And they said 65%. You can see the difference there for the electrical industry, pharmaceutical industry, and the machinery industry, which had absolutely no women working on the plant floor in 1941, but figured half of them would be that uh, in 1943. The Denver Ordnance Plant at 6th Avenue in Kipling, as I said, made over 6 million bullets a day of three different kinds of 30 caliber, or 44 different kinds of 30 caliber bullets. Now they originally said they were not going to discriminate. They had a federal contract and they weren't supposed to. However, Remington Arms initially only hired black women to work in three positions, the restrooms, the cafeterias, or in the lead shop. Now the restrooms and the cafeteria, of course, did not pay production wages, though they did pay better wages than what a, a domestic or a maid would have made in, in the city of Denver. Lead shop did pay production wages, but lead is toxic, and so every three weeks, the women's lead levels would be tested. If the lead level was too high, they were re, uh, removed from that position and placed in cafeteria or uh, the restrooms. Then when their blood levels returned to normal, they could be back at the lead shop. Well, that continued for about 18 months until um, black leaders in Denver, such as the NAACP, the Phyllis Wheatley branch of the YWCA, 
and the Colorado Association of Colored Women's Clubs threatened to sue Remington Arms. And then they did open up uh, production jobs as well as inspecting jobs for black women. Now Colorado Fuel and Iron in Colorado was um, the biggest coal, coal producing company in the Rocky Mountain region at the beginning of uh, World War II. You can see here the different ethnicities and uh, backgrounds of, of Pueblo natives. They were hired for every single job. Uh, they worked in the furnace area. They made packing crates and stenciled them. They obviously worked in the office with personnel and payroll and um, all of those kinds of things, reports. They um, drove heavy equipment like cranes, supply trucks, um, you know, as I said, practically every job that could be done at Colorado Fuel and Iron, the women were involved in. Other women left Colorado and got jobs in another state in a war factory. Bonnie Strutzel was a graduate of Rocky Ford High School, went out to see her sister in California and later ended up getting a job as a riveter there at um, the Naval base. Some women were recruited out of college. Louise Favram was a mathematics major at University of Denver when Curtis Wright recruited her into their uh, very novel engineering cadet training program. And this was held at a number of universities, most of them in the Midwest, that would train the women to be engineers in a year program because of course they're eliminating all the humanities and everything else and just you know taking it right down to engineering classes. The women would take aerodynamics and hydraulics and things like that. Then once they graduated they were hired by Curtis Wright uh, to work in one of the factories. Louise became uh, a hydraulic specialist for a dive bombing plane at the uh, Columbus, Ohio plant. As I said, paperwork was very important. And even though um, this recruiting poster, as most of them did, showed a white person, um, it was actually stenography and type, typing work, secretarial work, which figured also to be very beneficial for African-Americans, especially those in uh, Colorado. Prior to the war, to apply, when one applied for a federal civil service job, you had to attach a photograph. So that meant that women graduate, you know, graduating from high school with all their secretarial skills, if they tried to apply for a federal civil service job and they were black, chances are they weren't going to be hired. But um, early in the war, um, Mary Beth McLeod Bethune, the Roosevelts, and others, the NAACP, the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, all got together and were able to get the federal civil service requirements changed so that photographs were no longer required. And so this became a huge boon for African-American women. Frances Hale graduated from a Denver high school, scored very well on the exam, and was ordered to report to Washington, D.C where one of her jobs was to work in the liaison office between the Office of Price Administration and the uh, House of Representatives. So she actually worked in the basement uh, of the Capitol. She was there um, in a different job prior to that. She was in this large uh, typing pool and anybody who wanted uh, dictation taken or a report typed up or whatever would just go out, take one of the women from this huge room and you know get the work done. So one time um, Frances told me that she was sitting at this desk and she was typing away. The young white woman next to her across the aisle came back from lunch, walked over to Frances and proceeded to pour her drink all over Frances went back and sat down at her desk. Francis got up, walked over to the woman, shook her clothes off onto the woman who looked up at her and said, you should be in Oklahoma picking cotton. 
at which point Frances grabbed her pocketbook and hit her. She said nobody in the room said anything. The woman didn't say anything. None of the other typists said a word. Frances went back to her desk and continued typing. Other women were recruited to be crypt analysts. Uh, there you have Nancy Thompson in the back row who um, worked in Washington, D.C., decoding um, slips of paper that had Japanese letters and um, numbers on them. I, some people have credited Napoleon Bonaparte, whether or not he said it, was that um, an army marches on its stomach. If that's the case, the American ranchers and farmers really had their work cut out for them. Not only did they have to um, grow the food or raise the food for the United States, but also for our military and for uh, many of our allies who of course uh, had been suffering for years with having joined World War II much earlier than we had. So, um, and of course there's a shortage of labor at the same time you need to grow more crops. In Colorado, we relied on sugar beet workers in Eastern Colorado. We also hired um, braqueros from Mexico. This would be male laborers, agricultural laborers that came in under contract to work for us. And they also used um, interns from Amachi as well as high school students. On the Western Slope, Ann Enstrom was a senior at Grand Junction High School. She was an honor student. And she and the other honor students were uh, approached by the peach industry there to work the first few weeks of their school year because the harvest still wasn't completed. And the school, of course, let them do so. So the young men would be bused out to the orchards to harvest the peaches, and the girls were uh, bused to the canneries in Palisade, where they ran the peaches through steam baths and then picked the skins off of the peaches before they went into uh, the cans. So after the two weeks of doing that, then they reported back to school uh, and made up the work that they had missed. Now, my, this is probably my favorite Rosie the Riveter. Um, this was done by Norman Rockwell. You're probably familiar with his other um, May 1943 Saturday evening post cover where um, Rosie is holding the ham sandwich and she's got her welding mask on, um, or mask on, I should say, and she's got her rivet gun across her waist and, and all of that and her saddle shoes. Uh, but I like this one even more because it shows so many of the different jobs that women did to help in the war effort. You have the nurse's cap, you have the cap for uh, the trolley car or the street car, you've got the hoe and the rake for agricultural work, you've got the milk being delivered by women now and not the milkman, uh, you've got the watering can for the victory gardens, uh, the oil can for working as mechanics and machinists, um, the change purse there, the lantern for the railroad yards, the school books for the teachers, all of these different jobs that women were involved in uh, for the war effort. Now the third part of the book is women on the home front. With so many women joining the Army Nurse Corps and the Navy Nurse Corps, that left a shortage of civilian nurses in the United States. So the government uh, founded the Cadet Nurse Corps program. And this, they took the standard 36 month nursing training program and shortened it, not by the amount of coursework or anything, but the amount of time to 30 months. So people like Pauline Apodaca of Denver would apply to a nursing school that was approved by the CNC and go through the 30, a month program, getting coursework as well as practical training in a hospital. Once they graduated from that program, they were required to work in civilian hospitals or with the public health service uh, in, at um, Indian reservations or join the Army Nurse Corps or the Navy Nurse Corps. Pauline Apodaca went to Seton Hall 
uh, Seton Nursing School in Colorado Springs. And she was so inspired by the nun who was running the program that she dropped out of the program and joined that order instead. Later, after the war, she went back to nursing school, received her um, cert certification, her registration, and was a lifelong nurse working with migrant workers. Thelma Mori um, did go through the entire course work uh, prior to the end of the war and continued as a nurse uh, for the rest of her um, adult career. The American Red Cross, of course, was vitally important, not only overseas, but here in the United States, running a number of programs. One of them was the Nurses Aid Program. And there on the uh, third from the right is Martha, or May, excuse me, May Wilkins from Fort Collins. And she really wrestled with whether or not she should get a war job or should she, you know, doing something to help the war effort, or should she get another job to just bring in extra money uh, to the household? Her husband was a newspaper editor. And even though she didn't like hospitals and she didn't like uniforms, she decided that the best use of her time and the best use of her during the war would to be as joining as a nurse's aide. And she did that and she actually found out that um, she did the work very well and she um, enjoyed it and was very proud of what she had done. Now, another woman who joined the nurse's aid program was Clara Morse, who, um, to, who was a widow in December of 1941. And on December 7th, 1941, her only two sons were killed on the USS Arizona with the Japanese attack. As you can imagine, she was absolutely devastated. So she joined the nurse's aid program and she kept a notebook um, during the war. And one of her entries was, after Pearl Harbor, my life was over, or this is the way I felt. I just keep fighting the longing to stop here and go to them, but there is work to be done and I must not give up. Time to dress now in my dear little Red Cross uniform. How I love it. Other young women joined the uh, Recreation Corps and worked as donut girls or recreation um, officers. Um, Eva Christensen from Brush, Colorado joined and served donuts and coffee in uh, England as well as in France during the war. She kept a diary and at one point uh, submitted an article that the Ladies Home Journal paid for and uh, printed. She talked about one time, at one point in time, she added up that she had made anywhere from 160,000 to 175,000 donuts and serving, you know, thousands of cups of coffee and wiping that counter uh, thousands of different times. The United Service Organization or USO, of course, had uh, canteens and clubs throughout the United States and in Europe. This is one of the uh, clubs for black soldiers in Denver. And then on the home front, you had people that were uh, unable to buy nylons, that were trying to recycle rubber and metal and other things to help in the war effort, following the government mandates of um, rationing, which was started with sugar rationing in early 1942. Everybody had ration stamps and ration books. Um, this war sage is made out of a war bond stamp that was covered in cellophane, curled to look like a petal, and then the um, fake leaves added. And these would be sold at dances to earn money uh, for the war effort. Then you had a victory mail and V pins for victory. And again, the stamps and um, tokens that were the change for the ration stamps. As the war drove to an end, women were reminded that they were hired for the duration of the war and it was gonna be time for them to return home. Many women did not want to uh, leave their jobs and were most unhappy uh, when they were forced to do so. In interviewing these women, I interviewed over 30 uh, women and a couple of men for this book, as well as reading and listening to hundreds of other uh, transcripts. I found that the women 
that the war really affected these women, not just during the war years, but also in the years afterwards. It changed how they raised their children and how they felt about themselves and their place in the world. Um, it planted the seeds for not just their future lives, but also for the civil rights and feminist movements of the 1950s and 1960s. The women's legacy was not just an end to World War II, it was also a new beginning. Thank you. And thank you very much, Gail, for that uh, wonderful presentation there uh, based on your book, uh, Colorado Women in World War II. Uh, if you, to our attendees, if you enjoyed the book, uh, if you enjoyed the presentation, the book goes into so much more detail, wonderfully researched. Uh, pick it up at your local library or bookstore. If you have any questions for Gail, please feel free to deposit them in your chat box located uh, along the bottom of your screen where it says chat. Just click in that and uh, we will get to your questions as time permits. So you said in your uh, end of your presentation there you spoke with about 30 women from uh, who served in the Second World War in many of those roles about how many roughly guessing how many women's stories did you read in the in the research that you that you did? I would say a couple of hundred. Um, you know, the Library of Congress Veterans History Project has um, thousands of male and um, female records. Uh, Rosie the Riveter Memorial and Monument in uh, Richmond, California has them. Of course, many libraries and museums have them. Um, I, of course, was looking for women with Colorado ties. So um, sometimes you could find that out without listening to the entire tape, and other times you had to go through everything to, to see if you found a nugget that you, that you could use. Sure, sure. Um, and tell our attendees as well, um, who may not know, you developed a character, uh, Gail Murphy, Colorado's Rosie the Riveter, and I know you do many presentations as her uh, throughout the state. Matter of fact, I believe last year, right before uh, the uh, COVID started, you were down here at Manitou Springs and did that presentation. Um, tell us a little bit about Gail Murphy and about the presentation you do with her. Okay. Um, Gail Murphy is a composite character that I made up from interviews and research I had done on the Denver Ordnance Plant. I wanted to develop a character that I could present the home front and women's roles during the war to my sophomore students in high school. And so that's what happened with that. And then it just kind of exploded on me since 1997, as you said, that, that I do it for organizations and groups throughout the state. Uh, even out to Omaha. So I come as uh, a woman war worker who just got off her job and I have a 1930s big radio that I talk about and um, I talk about what the women do as far as work on the home front, uh, like the Warsage, I show that. I have letters that I read, victory mail that I show them um, and talk about what women did, you know, that I have friends in the military and where they're stationed and things like that. Um, so I just use it as a vehicle to talk about women's contribution um, and to honor them and the men who um, won World War II, really. Sure. One thing you mentioned in your presentation, I uh, happened to know a gentleman many years ago uh, who had been at Camp Amachi here out on the Eastern Plains. And he said that he had been sent to Amachi, and as soon as he was done with his time there, the United States turned around and drafted him into the military. Uh, and, you know, he, he wasn't bitter about it. He, he, he got a chuckle out of it, but uh, it kind of 
described the contradictions all too well that that we would see in these histories and uh, that you had mentioned right there about some of the Japanese women who had been in Amachi being able to get out and enlist into the military. Right, right. And many of them also joined uh, the Cadet Nurse Corps. Um, the Cadet Nurse Corps did not discriminate against Blacks or other um, you know, ethnicities. And so they really, there was, um, there was a book written by Thelma Mori just on Japanese American women who joined the Cadet Nurse Corps. But as you say, that's um, an interesting thing to look at. Sure. Definitely. And I see that Judy mentioned, and I, I meant to mention, I'm glad she mentioned it, that in Weld County, they used German POWs to work in the fields. And they did that throughout Colorado. Colorado had many POW camps. Uh, the largest, some of the largest were, of course, on the Eastern Plains. So they did use POWs uh, for labor. Yes. I'm glad she brought that up. Thank you, Judy. Yes, thanks, Judy. Um, so tell us a little bit about uh, your, you have a website, correct, if people want to learn more about you. Yes, I do. My website is gailbeaton.com. Uh, and there you'll also find that I've done a third book. It just came out last, well, two months ago on the Women's Bank, which is a Den Denver success story. That was co-authored by, with Dr. Tom Noel. When I was, when I was preparing some introductory remarks, I looked at your website earlier and noticed that as well. Uh, interesting story there. And uh, it looks like there's going to be a Zoom presentation as well for that. So uh, maybe if people want more information, they can visit your website, gailbeaton.com. That'd be great. And Judy Coles also commented, thank you, Gail. I remember the camp in Alt where the prisoners were kept in the VFW hall. And uh, one of the guards and his wife stayed in her home. Wow. You know, um, there's a, a passage from your book here uh, in the acknowledgments that I'll read, which uh, is very profound when we discuss this subject or, uh, and we remember history. There is a saying that when a person dies, it is as if a library is burned. As the greatest generation ages, we continue to lose women and men whom I or others have interviewed. Each loss saddens me. My hope is that this book will enlighten readers to the contributions of Colorado women in World War II and spark family conversations and remembrances. I encourage those who know a member of the generation that came of age during World War II to make a concerted effort to learn and preserve their stories so that upon their passing, we will not lose stories from these libraries. And your book does that wonderfully, Gail. Um, any closing uh, remarks from you? No, I appreciate you having me. This has been wonderful. We appreciate you being here. Um, Gail Beaton's book from the University of Colorado Press, uh, Colorado Women in World War II. Uh, check out Gail Beaton's website, gailbeaton.com. And hopefully here down the road, we can have you back here at the Pikes Peak Library District in person. Uh, you always do fantastic presentations. Thank you. I would love to come back. Thank you for being with us. Thank you uh, to all of our attendees for being with us today. Again, the presentation uh, will be on the Pikes Peak Library District's YouTube channel in about a week or so. So if you would like to watch again or know someone that would be interested in watching the presentation, uh, please refer them there. Uh, my contact information is also on the calendar site. So please feel free to contact me by phone or by email and I'll do what I can to help you out. Thank you very much for being with us this Thursday evening and hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Thank you.